James. Fantastic. Thank you, James. Thank you, Christine. So, as Christine said, I'm Dallas, and I'm Chief Executive of the Royal Trinity Hospice, which may seem odd to you that I've come to speak to you about VR tonight, but hopefully it all will become clear. Uh, my name's Leon Ancliffe. Uh, as Christine said, uh, I'm the Managing Director of Flix Films, and I genuinely think I probably have the best job in the world. Um, I get to use VR in healthcare, and I also get to work with Dallas and Trinity, and I've got to be honest, over the last three years, some of the work we've done has been just the most exceptional work and the, the best thing I've ever been involved in and I've absolute, absolutely loved every minute of it. Wow. So we're going to take you through a whistle-stop tour of some of the things we've done with virtual reality in healthcare settings and we're going to start off by telling you a little bit about the journey that Royal Trinity and Flix have been on and then Leon's going to tell you a little bit more about stuff that he's been doing with other organisations as well which we hope you'll find uh, interesting. <coughs> so Leon, should we start with our journey at Trinity? Absolutely. So, you, you start You start and tell them about Sarah. Okay, really guys, important. I do have a tendency to drone on about this section a little bit. Um, and if I do start droning on, just scratch your nose and then I'll know I'll need to move on. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, we've been making films now for the last 10 years in healthcare. And predominantly, a lot of those films have been training films. Now, how many of you guys participated in the Ice Bucket Challenge? Anyone? Okay. Yay. Quite a few of you did the Ice Bucket Challenge. Now, a lot of that money was... Um, was raised, was um, given to the M&D Association, it was meant to go into training and development. Now, we put a tender together um, to the M&D Association to actually work on their training films. And we were very lucky, we got the opportunity to work with them, and I got the opportunity to meet this remarkable woman, Sarah Ezekiel. Now, Sarah was diagnosed with M&D about 17 years ago. That's quite remarkable, really, because usually from diagnosis through to end of life, it can be very, very rapid. Um, now, Sarah had got M&D, and it had taken away her, her speech. Um, she wasn't able to, to, to use her limbs. Um, but she, she was able to communicate with eye gaze technology, and part of the film that I was making for her was looking at how she was using technology to add quality to her life. And I remember one of the questions I asked her was, do you have any regrets? And she said, when I was your age, um, I really wanted to swim with dolphins. And then I got M&D, I never got the opportunity to do that. Now, we haven't put the film in the presentation today because it's quite long, but what we did was we arranged for Sarah to have an opportunity to experience swimming with dolphins in virtual reality, and that was in 2016. We'd never seen anything done like that before. And honestly, that moment she had that experience, everyone in the room, you could feel the hairs on the back of their neck stand up. It, it just blew you away. And I knew from that minute that we wanted to start looking at how we could use virtual reality in healthcare. So, we approached Royal Trinity Hospice. I did, I won't forget the day. I'm sat in my office, chief executive, and Leon comes up with a pair of goggles and a smartphone in his hand and says, you got a minute, boss? <laughs> yeah, okay, I may live to regret this. But actually, he put the goggles on me, gave me my first ever virtual reality experience, said, wouldn't this be amazing, Dallas? We could do this with the patients that are downstairs, palliative care patients. We could give them experiences they're not capable of doing yet. I mean, I think we spoke for a couple of hours, really. We got very enthused about all the things we could do with virtual reality. And I went, yeah, OK, let, let's give it a go, Leon. Let's have a look at doing bucket lists. But there were some challenges. We're clinical people. I'm a clinical person. Technology, ah! It wasn't going to be, you know, really good bedfellows there. So we had, we had a challenge with the anxiety about using new tech uh, around the hospice and obviously you know I've got IT, goes, uh, IT go girls and guys that have got the most amazing firewalls so were we actually going to be able to stream the stuff that Leon wanted to to play within the hospice and also we wanted the experiences or the experiences needed to be tetherless didn't they? Yeah that was really important to us um, basically when you're working with people who are coming to the end of their life they very often have very limited mobility and back in 2016, there was a lot of incredible virtual reality content, but it was all tethered. It was all running on these really powerful computers. Now, if you're giving someone a VR experience who has limited mobility, the last thing we want to do is make them feel any more prohibited. So one of the key things we want to do was make sure we were able to deliver virtual reality without it being tethered. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah, so we went forward and, and achieved that. And what we also realised quite early on was that by giving these experiences to people, we were unlocking 
emotional responses and we were also sparking memories in them. So we had to be ready for that. We had to be ready for the emotional impact of those immersive virtual reality um, experiences. And I've got to say, they weren't all good, were they? Well, they wasn't. Um, initially, up until this point, they were all really, really positive. Um, but that's why this piece of film is actually really significant because after that, after we gave this experience, we recognised we actually had to go forward and actually start to do some research so we could actually properly understand what was happening. So this is Susie, and um, sorry, James. Uh, so this is this is Susie, and uh, this uh, Susie was um, she was at the hospice, and we gave her a virtual reality experience. So that was a bittersweet moment for Susie. It was a great experience, but we realised at that point that we really, really needed to look into this more. And when we started to look for research into the use of virtual reality in palliative care in particular, but also in vulnerable patient groups, we realised there wasn't a lot of proper research done in the field. So we decided we'd do some, because why not? So Royal Trinity Hospice with Flix Films decided we would do an ethically approved study, a randomised controlled study, um, to begin to understand the potential of VR to reduce symptom load, increase feelings of well-being, and actually be an enjoyable therapeutic intervention for patients in palliative care. And what? an additional... Yeah, no, thing so as well. because we had such a unique opportunity to actually um, do, do this study with um, Trinity, we also thought it'd be great to actually start to find out how we could improve content and what type of content was people actually wanting. So it was almost like, um, what's the word? It, it was, we, we actually wanted to basically find out what it was that people were connecting with within the environment. Yeah. And interestingly, it wasn't always about the vision, it was also about the audio and specialised audio, but that's something we'll talk about yeah. a little bit later. But as you, many of you will know, doing an ethically approved randomised control study is not the easiest thing in the world. You layer on palliative care patients who are dying, my goodness, did we have some challenges. And the first one was to get ethical approval. We're a hospice, we're a charity. We can't get ethical approval on our own. So we had to find a partner, and a partner in the NHS seemed like the sensible thing. So after some time, we persuaded St George's Hospitals University Trust to come in and actually oversee the, the research for us from an ethical point of view. But that was quite a step forward um, for us and actually for hospices. The other thing is about recruitment. It is notoriously difficult to get palliative care patients to participate in research. They've got lots of other things going on in their life and lots of other things to think about. So actually we ended up with 20 participants doing the full research study, but that took us over a year to do that. Because, I'm gonna flick one yeah, and come yeah. back to you, because attrition, of course, was reasonably high because people got poorly or people died. So actually it was really quite difficult to keep the studies momentum going all the time. You've got to say about content? Yeah, technically, um, when we first started the study, um, which was about 18 months ago now, there was a lot of virtual reality content that was publicly available. 
And what was really important for us was that we were able to download the content and use it without having to use Wi-Fi. Because the last thing you want to be able, what you want to do is give someone a virtual reality experience where they feel completely immersed, and then it starts to buffer. It's, it's just, it, it's literally like the worst experience ever. So that was really important to us. Now, 18 months ago, um, YouTube, Vimeo, lots of other different platforms had a lot of virtual reality content that, was, that you could download. Um, it wasn't something that we were selling, it was purely for the study. Um, and then they changed, and then we wasn't able to do that. And part of the study was that, um, that we had focused content, didn't we, Dallas? And yep. we also had content where it was randomised. And if we were able to give people content that was focused and it was content that they wanted and they could reflect on, our hypothesis was that it would have a greater impact on their pain and general well-being. Um, now, when you've got so much content initially and you've got the study in your head, um, we thought this is not going to be a problem, there's so much content. And then when they stopped, stopped with the content online, and we wasn't able to download it. Sorry, James. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> um, we basically had to start creating yeah. the content to be able to deliver it. Absolutely. So as Leon alluded to there, we had 20 participants. Ten of them got randomised um, content. Four sessions over four weeks. And the other people got content that we knew they quite wanted from interviewing them. And the beginning of each session, the patients filled a self-assessment of their symptoms and their well-being. And then after the session, they also did the same again. So we had before and afters, and then at the end of the four sessions, there was a, a controlled interview process by one of our social workers. So we think we've ticked all the academic boxes. The proof of the pudding, of course, will now come in that we've closed the study, and we're in the process of having it analysed so that we can write it up. So please do watch this space. Um, it will probably take a few months, I'm guessing after Christmas, but what we'll do is be able to write up the therapeutic value of VR in a palliative care setting and we'll also be able to write up um, some guidance we hope about what makes good VR content for this particular patient group if no other patient group. So what that made us realise was during the study we got really quite carried away about virtual reality if, I, if I'm completely honest and we started thinking what if we used it for this and this and this and these are just some of the things that we've done um, with Leon and Flix Films um, at Trinity. Do you want to talk us through some? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what we did was we, we started asking some of the patients what they wanted and how, how they envisaged we might be able to use VR. Um, one, of the key th one of the big things that they said was that they were, um, maybe 10 years ago, if someone were coming to the end of their life and they had young children or grandchildren, they might want to write a letter. And, and that was really powerful and meant a lot to that family member move forward a few years, maybe another 10 years, they want to make a video, they want to do it on a tablet or they want to do it on the phone, they want to make sure that's a legacy. We thought, could we maybe take that even further? Um, we're really at the early stages yeah, of this, nice. but I have to genuinely say, out of the ones we've done, it's incredible. When they've created a message which is virtual, that you can actually put on and they can feel like they're in that environment with their loved one who's passed. It's, it's, it's the ultimate gift, and it's, it's been an incredible process to get to us. Equally, it's a very delicate process. It is indeed. And had we not <laughs> had such a good relationship with Trinity, we would never have been able to try these things out. Um, another thing is live streaming. Um, and uh, yeah, live streaming. Um, Dallas, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I'm, in fact, I'm going to combine live streaming and shared experiences because some of the most memorable moments we've had over the last year, um, one of them, Leon took um, the 360 camera, which is actually filming us at the back of the room there, um, to uh, an awards ceremony at a secondary school and live stream it to mum, who was in bed in the hospice. And she was goggles on, sat next to her husband, and she watched the whole ceremony. She could turn to her, her husband, turn to the camera, say, oh my goodness, and, and it, yeah, tears to the eyes. It was the most amazing thing. And then the other one that will stick in my memory forever is a, a family, a young mum, again, who, who was dying. And Leon, through the power of virtual reality, took the family of four to Euro Disney. So they all had goggles on in, a, in one of our rooms that was made up to look like Disney. Mickey Mouse was there. It was phenomenal. And the four of them sat with goggles on and watched the parade. It's and the little Lees were going, Mummy, Mummy, can you see Belle? Can you see Cinderella? And... To be able to give that family that shared memory, um, if I wasn't already a convert to virtual reality, I would have been that day. 
because it was amazing. Which is interesting because this was last year and we'd spoken to Google about, because we used Google Daydream as a platform and we also, now we're using the Oculus Go. But what we wanted was we, we wanted to be able to share that, we wanted them to be able to share that experience. Virtual reality is an experience, it's a lived experience mm -hmm. that you're having. And as a, as a human being, as a, we want to share things, but it wasn't possible. And even now, it's still not possible. Yeah. It is possible if you pay a lot of money and you join one of the, um, the shared groups, but it's not something that I think would really help mm. virtual reality move forward at a, at a more rapid yeah. pace. Or you need a Leon who can yeah. run around the room and go, start, 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 yeah. well, really no, quickly. It, interestingly, <laughs> the way we were able to do it, do you remember back in um, when you used to get a film and it used to tick down? Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> all I did was I took that and I put it on the back of it and I got everyone to put it and they did it all together. So we made it a part of the actual experience. And they all counted down together. They put the goggles on and then they had the experience. Incredible. You've got to go back sometimes to be able to move forward. <laughs> the most amazing day. Uh, virtual reality tours and virtual reality training we're, we're going to come on to. So I won't say any more about that right at the moment. Yeah. Okay. So what this did... All the work that Trinity and Flix were doing got a lot of attention. Some of you might have seen the Inside Out program um, that, that mentioned the work we were doing. Um, and this created opportunities for Flix, and rightly so. And this is one of them, which uh, well, we're going to tell you about. Yeah, this is something that we've been working on for the last eight months now. And this is CW Plus, which is um, Chelsea and Westminster Hospital Charity. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're, they're responsible for creating environments where patients are able to go into that environment feel very relaxed. Um, and interestingly, they'd seen what we were doing and they said, um, Leon, we love what you're doing with VR. Um, we're interested in the, the results of the study, which we wasn't able to disclose at that point. Nope. <laughs> um, but we're looking at using virtual reality for cardiac catheterization, which, to be honest, I didn't know anything about <laughs> at all. Um, but when they started talking to me about it and I started doing some research, I understood why it might work. Mm. Um, so this is... Do you know, this is the clinical this, side, you're clinical probably going to do it better than I will. <laughs> so, cardiac catheterization, passing um, a, a catheter, a probe, down through a major vessel to someone's heart, either expanding it, having a look at it. I'm sure some of you guys know more about this than I do. But the whole process takes about an hour. And it obviously is anxiety inducing, isn't it? I don't want a probe going down through my major vessel towards my heart. Thank you very much. And what um, Chelsea and Westminster were having to do, they were having to use medication um, to help patients relax enough to be able to have this uh, procedure done. So what they're doing now with the help of Leon's uh, content is they're actually giving people virtual reality experiences whilst the procedure's uh, being undertaken to see whether or not that actually is better than the medicines. Because if you have a sedation medicine, then you're in hospital for a, an extra couple of hours to, you know, to recover from that. Um, you may have an adverse effect from it, those sorts of things. So Leon is making content, or has made content, yeah. for CW Plus to use whilst this procedure is going on, and they're about to research that as well. It is. It's about to go into a pilot, and it's, each piece of content lasts for an hour because that's how long the procedure might, um, take. might, last, <laughs> uh, might take. Um, yeah. How do I feel about giving someone a virtual reality experience for an hour? That's why we need to do the research. We need to understand that. Um, but right in the middle of the project, being a relatively small independent VR company, it was a bit of a scary moment for us because <laughs> we worked really hard to get the contract with this company, uh, with this charity, and we were really excited about what we were doing. And we'd already create, we, we were commissioned to create 10 pieces of content. And we created five, and we submitted them, and they loved them. And then they came back to us and they said, Leon, we love what you've done, but we're going to have to stop the contract. We're really sorry, and we haven't thought about this. I says, why? And he says, because all the content you've created... When you put the goggles on, it looks fantastic, but our patients are led on their back when they're having the procedure. Believe it or not, we'd got to that stage and we'd not actually thought and about we're the patient. At the sky. And it was devastating. I truly <laughs> thought, that's it. We're in trouble. There's nothing I can do. And I, and I, I, but I did say to him, well, I'd love to have a meeting, talk about what we did well, what we didn't do, um, and see whether in the future we might be able to look at maybe an alternative. And that morning I woke up and I'd had a really good dream. I won't go into what the dream was about. <laughs> but when I was led on my back, I was dreaming, <laughs> but I was thinking, I was thinking about something forward. But even though I was on my back, I wasn't thinking about constantly looking at the sky, which all our patients had been having. So I wondered, well, what if I go back into the edit and I take the content and I reorientate the content? 
So when you put on the goggles, you're looking at the floor, but when you lie on your back, you're looking directly forward. And this was last year, and no one had done that before. And, and still to this day, I think it's a bit of a USP that I'm, I'm really happy to talk about. <laughs> yeah. But this was the first, I, and that morning I went to the meeting and I, I pulled out this little blow up bed and I says, would you just try this out? The CEO wouldn't, but one of the members of staff did. So I'd just love you to watch this. Huh? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's a really, really short clip and we've got a little bit more on the website that yeah. talks about that. But if you have a virtual reality experience when you're led on your back, it's amazing. It <laughs> definitely reduces any I'll anxiety. take his word for that. I've not tried it yet. <laughs> really good. So, so there you go. On to tours, Yeah, so the other thing we thought while, while we were thinking about what can we use virtual reality was that um, a lot of people are scared of hospices. You know, we're, we're dim, dark, dingy places that you really don't want to go in because you'll come out feet first. Um, and a lot of things that we, we have to manage are people's expectations of the hospice. So Leon said, well, why don't you have a virtual reality tour of the hospice, Dallas? Um, because that way you can take Trinity out to people at home. You can show them exactly what it's like. It can be personalized. This was really important to us. You know, you can have members of staff, you can have patients, you can have the gardener. You know, pe people out in the community can see what a, what a room looks like, what the cafe looks like, what the gardens are like. And uh, we're going to show you a short clip now. Yeah. Very short, very short, because it starts with me and I hate being do you know in what, the film. I've been trying to master this for ages. How do you give an audience the opportunity to see what it's like to be VR? It's a bit <laughs> crude, but have a watch. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, and Hello. welcome to Royal Trinity Hospice. <laughs> I'm Dallas, and I'm lucky enough to be Chief Executive here. We know that some people don't understand what we do in a hospice, but we're really proud of what we do. So we'd like to open our doors to you today and take you on a 360-degree tour. So don't forget to look all around you while you're on the tour. I'm going to head into reception now, where I'll meet you and introduce you to Sylvie. So it carries on like this for a wee while. We won't bore you with the whole thing. But as we go through, it introduces you to different members of staff. They show you the area of the hospice that they work in. And every so often, there's little round circles that come up. I'm not going to see one now that I'm looking for one. But you can, you can eye gaze and, and follow those as well, or, or tap on them if you're using a tablet or a phone. So you can meet the gardener. He does a great stint in his shorts. I love that one. You can go into one of our bedrooms. And what we found is that the community nurses, even when they're not, if they don't take goggles out with them, they take a tablet out or even a smartphone, they're able to swipe and, and move. And several people have come to us and said, I wouldn't I have come in to you. There you go, there's me going bye-bye. Um, <laughs> they wouldn't have come in had they not seen the virtual reality tour because actually it made them feel that the place was light and airy and welcoming. And also it's been great with our funders as well because we've actually been able to show them the place that we're talking about uh, when we're basically trying to get money out of them, Let, let's be honest about that. But it's absolutely fantastic for us that you can use it on tablets and phones and on PCs because not everybody's got a pair of goggles. Not, most people have got a smartphone, but not necessarily the full kit. So it's really important when we made the tour that my community nurses could take it out and use it on an iPad. And also, what was really important was that it was personable. You'll probably be able to go online now and go onto Google Earth and tap on a hotel or tap on a... And you'll be able to get a full 360. But if you've not got anything living in that environment, it feels dead, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't feel alive. And the last thing you want when you go into a hospice, and I'm very, very lucky, I've actually got residency at Trinity. So I know exactly what it's like to work within that mm. environment. And the last thing I'd want for one of my loved ones is to go into a hospice, even in a virtual world, and not feel supported throughout. Absolutely. And I think we were able to achieve that with that first yeah, crack of the, the whip. It was the first hospice virtual reality tour ever. <laughs> and now there are several of them because uh, people want them because yeah. they are so useful, aren't they? Absolutely. But like everything, life has moved on. It certainly has. And um, tools are incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. Citran. Um, so, talk, you know, going off what Dallas was saying about fundraisers. Now, the M&D Association came to us and they says, Leon, we love what you've done with the, the Royal Trinity. Again, it had that link with Royal Trinity Hospice with their VR tour. We want to create a virtual reality tour where we can show our funders how their money is being spent. 
And I says, well, how's it being spent? And he says, research, research, research and development. And I says, well, where is this place? And it was Citran, the, Sh <laughs> the Sheffield Institute of Trans Translational... Why don't you let the CEO say? Do you know what? I will. <laughs> but what you're about to see is a video. Thanks for that, Dallas. Great to say. Um, <laughs> you're about to see a video, and, and it's, it's, it's been taken from a desktop computer. So what you'll be able to do is you'll see it being interactive with. Um, but equally, although you'll see it as a, in a desktop view, if you tap that, that image just there in the corner, even on a smartphone, it will go into VR mode. You'll be able to drop your phone into a pair of VR goggles, whether it's a daydream, whether it's just a pair of cardboard goggles, and have that experience. Um, and also interact with the environment. So I'll, I'll play that. So here we go. This is how it would open on a desktop. I now You've got the... Uh, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Thanks for that, Pam. <laughs> um, but also what you see, like down the left-hand side, you've got a menu. Um, so what we wanted was to create a tour where you could actually find out about the people that are presenting to you. So you can click on the presenters. You can also go through and use the hotspots. Hotspots are really important with a virtual reality tour because everyone wants to interact with them. Um, so I think this is going to show you a little bit. So if you were looking at that spot, zoom, you'd go straight through. You go into this. With regards to this tour, what happens is you actually follow a skin sample through the actual virtual reality experience. And that's Lee. Lee's fantastic. And also that map as well. You can interact with that map. It's over two floors, is Citroën. Um, but this is a really important space. And I'll just show you how VR can be used in an environment like this. When a person with MND gives a skin sample, it is combined with special chemicals that turn them into stem cells. You can click on this machine for a closer look at this process. So if you this is a tissue culture hood which keeps the environment sterile. Filtered air is blown down to stop any bacteria entering. We sterilize the pet and transferring the sample from the test tube into a culture flask. The pink liquid is called media and it contains all of the nutrients the cell needs to grow. So initially it was just going to be a, you know, about fundraisers, but then they were like, well, let's make it into an educational tool. Well, let's find well, out about I the staff. I decided to become a researcher just before university, uh, and then I decided to become a neuroscientist pretty much um, in the middle of it, um, because I still remember the first class I had in neuroscience. Um, our lecturer basically told us, although everybody thinks that what they do is the most important thing, um, just remember that you are your nervous system. And that's the brilliant thing, it's just evolving constantly. And, and the more you collaborate, the more you talk, uh, you know, share ideas, the more it evolves. Happy to move on. Are we all right, James? Can we do another five minutes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is that let's, okay? Let's do the last bubble. Oh, I love this one. <laughs> go on, off you go. No, no, no. <laughs> well, no, I mean, my background's in training. The first film I ever made was for St. Joseph's Hospice in East London, training young GPs on how, what, what, um, Tra training new GPs what it's like to spend five weeks with five terminal ill patients and what makes a good doctor. It was the first film we ever made. And, and then ten years later, we were looking at how VR was having such a positive impact on these people and how they were connecting with it. We were like, could we actually start creating virtual reality mm. training films and see whether that would have an impact? So we came up with Reels. And I have to say, I've got to credit Dallas with, with the name to a, to a point. <laughs> Um, but the acronym is Reality Enhanced Experiential Learning Scenarios. Is there anything you want to talk about about Reels, Dallas? Because you've experienced them and you're using them. Yeah, no, they, ha they can have, because they're immersive, they can have a massive impact. So, for instance, at Trinity, we have Reels that will place you in the bed as a patient. And the nurses will come in and talk over you and ignore you. So you get to understand how that feels. And then there's a good one and the nurses will actually come in and interact with you. So that's good. Or you can be a healthcare professional sat beside a bed of a very uh, distressed patient. You can be one of the nurses and you've got an angry relative in your face. So we're using these in, in real time um, at Trinity already. But it's opened the door for other things for you to do, isn't it? It certainly has. Um, so 
for the last 12 months, 18 months, been going out and talking about Reels, and we launched in November. And you can go onto the website, and if you've got an Android phone, we're not quite at the Apple yet, um, <laughs> but if you go on the Android phone, you can go into the website, and you can download all these training, re virtual reality training films completely for free. Um, just, in, just put in your details, download the content, you can actively start using them on your Android device. Um, we're actually looking, um, we've been working with Moorfields Eye Hospital, so we want to be able to give their staff the opportunity to experience what it's like to be a patient, someone with glaucoma or degenerative eye yep. condition. Um, and that's how you teach people. What's it like to be led in a bed and have surgeons over you talking about things that are completely inappropriate whilst they're actually doing your eye surgery? So it's about putting people in, them, in their shoes. Um, we're doing a project with the, HI, uh, with the Metro Charity on HIV disclosure, where again, we've been... For the last eight months, we've been interviewing um, young, young people with HIV and a lot of them that were born with it. And they're getting to the point in their lives now where they need to start talking about HIV and, and actually they're getting to the point where they're being asked to disclose their status. Mm. Well, how do you prepare someone to disclose their status? Do they do it on a date? Do they, do they do it when, you know, in, um, in a gym when a student comes over and says, I've seen, you know, your medicine was on the floor, why are you taking medicine? When is the right time to do that? So we've created a whole series of reels where you'll be able to put on the goggles and you'll be able to be that young person with HIV and you'll be able to experience that scenario. And what's beautiful about this project is you don't have one way of, well, that's it, you do have, you can either, so you, you have the experience and the person will say, um, you know, have you, you know, I saw you in hospital the other day, my sister saw you in hospital the other day, what's going on, is something you want to tell me? And then you can choose to disclose, or you can choose not to disclose, and you see the reaction to both of those disclosures. Mm. It sounds a little bit complicated, that we're going to launch in December, there'll be a whole series of them, it'd be yeah. really great to get your feedback again. So some of you scratching your nose then, so I must be waffling. <laughs> and then this Friday, uh, this has been 18 months in development. We're going to be filming at HMP, uh, at HM Prison Whitmore. Yep. And that is, yeah, we're filming the maximum security prison. We're going to be creating virtual reality training where you'll be able to put on the goggles and you'll be, ex be able to experience what it's like to be a prisoner in a maximum security prison. You know, even a prisoner needs respect. Yes. And, and what we're finding, and we've been interviewing prisoners in the prison, and we've been asking them about their experience and saying, when is, you know, when, when is the most challenging time? Why do you react like this to that prison officer, but you don't react like that to that one? And they'll say, well, you want to see what that guy said to me when he came in and did a search the other day. So we're creating that search. We're doing a, a positive one and a negative one. And then we're going to be able to go to the prison officers and say, that is how it feels. When you turn around and you belittle that prisoner and you treat him like an animal, that is why you get... That's why you get that sort of reaction. There's always an outcome. And then there's another scenario which will be based on risk assessment. When you'll be able to put on the goggles, you'll be a prison officer, and you'll have two prisoners that will be in your face and they'll be giving you hell. But actually, there's something else happening over there, and you'll be able to have a look at all that going on. It's really, really exciting stuff. Can we maybe hold the video, do you think? Uh, James, there's a little video. Uh, it's about four minutes. It's entirely up to you. We can Basically, it's just yeah. a little video that shows reels being used. Is that okay? Yeah. 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 Okay. Giving people a life experience that is beyond their physical ability is absolutely amazing. You can see it has a real impact on their lives. And what we want to do, we want to see whether we could achieve the same response using virtual reality in our training films. Real experiences are the best way we can learn, and that's why we created REALS. What REALS stands for is Reality Enhanced Experiential Learning Scenarios. They're developed to increase confidence and give users the best training experience possible. So today we're starting on a really exciting project to develop REALS training content to help our clinical staff become more aware of the situations that they might find themselves in and how to react to those. Reels are designed to give the best sensory experience through 360 vision and 360 spatialised audio. 360 sound design becomes very important in 360 film. It basically immerses the viewer in the experience. That experience becomes real. Oh, I'm 
that just been terrible. Great, it's just going to some something to tear up. I didn't expect the audio to, to have my attention taken by a sound that was behind me. The audio begins to show the viewer where to look. The thing with 360 is you can't fake it. The preparation that we put into making each of our reels is what makes them believable. We work really closely with service providers and we encourage them to share their life experiences with our 360 professional actors. I haven't had much confrontation yet in my training and I'm a little bit anxious about it, so I think having virtual reality will prepare me for the real life. With role players, there's always that worry that it's quite easy to make them quite silly or some people can be very over the top with it. The actor definitely brought it to life. It felt like it was an actual situation happening. It adds that depth of reality to it. The staff that have experienced reels for themselves now are really excited about the prospect of using it in training and they can see how real it's going to make everything feel. I think it's really useful as a training tool because there's nothing else that can prepare you for the emotion that you feel. I'm not good when people cry, so it was kind of nice to be exposed to it. We've got that good job. When you're, you're like in their world, you can see them crying and you can hear them crying and move your head around. If you experience it virtually, you feel that emotion, you deal with that emotion, you reflect on it, and then when it happens in real life, you're much more prepared. You can watch a video and you can learn a lot from the video, but this actually puts you in the film. But it is the closest thing to being there. Any environment where people need to act and react in a skilled and considered way is where Reels really comes into its own. And you guys should be looking to make sure everybody feels safe and secure here. It could have really helped people who haven't been in those situations. I would recommend this. I feel like this is the best way to kind of get that experience in a kind of safe environment. And, and it touches emotions. What we're trying to achieve with Reels is a complete immersion for the user. There is so much potential for reels, and that's what makes it really exciting. That's a lot of reels, isn't it? That's a lot of reels. <laughs> so, listen, we will stop now and we'll, we'll uh, shut up, but we just w hope that you've got a little taster of what we think the possibilities for virtual reality are, um, and virtual reality in some highly emotive and sensitive areas as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>